Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Jimmy Simpson Jr. I am a member of Youth Truths Partnerships team. Thank you so much for joining us today to listen to what American students had to say about their experiences of learning through the pandemic. So we are going to be live tweeting today's webinar. So you can follow along on Twitter at youth underscore truth. We will also be monitoring the Q&A submissions. Our colleagues may answer your questions as they come in, or we may save some for the end for our panelists to answer. So Youth Truth, we are a national nonprofit organization built on the philosophical and research-based principle that student voice is a necessary ingredient in school improvement. We collect student, staff, and family feedback about their experiences and provide actionable data to school systems and philanthropic funders. Today, my colleague, Dr. Jen DeForest and I will present findings from our report, Students Way In Part Three. So this builds on our Students Way In Part One report released last July and our Part Two report released just this past spring. So this was intended as a one-time effort, but as the pandemic intensified, it became clear that this school year deserved continued scrutiny. So throughout our presentation of findings, we will also hear from three visionary education leaders who joined in our work this year who are committed to listening to students. Dr. Eric Prater, superintendent at San Luis Coastal Unified School District in California. Dr. Shelley Reggiani, Executive Director of Equity, Community Engagement and Communications at North Clackamas School District in Oregon, and Stephanie Sibley, House Principal at Malden High School in Malden, Massachusetts. So we'd also like to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Walton Family Foundation, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their continued support of our efforts to listen to and learn from students. And a special thank you to our new partners, Scope and Sequence, for their wonderful work to create artful animations that amplify students' qualitative responses. And as ever, our thanks goes out to the thousands of student respondents whose voices are the heart of this report. Their wisdom will be key in helping us meet the challenges of this school year. So as a preamble to our presentation today, we would like to open with the first of our qualitative composites. These composites are drawn from the analysis of more than 480,000 open-ended student responses about their experiences in the pandemic. This composite features a simple emergent code that was present in the comments from students across the country, a resounding call for us to, as they put it over and over again, listen to us and do better. I know these times are unprecedented and no one really has known what to do, but the lack of change gives me, the student, an impression that you have given up on us. Please listen to us. Do the right thing and please do something. This is your best feedback that you are going to get. Please listen to it and do something. I just had to get that off my chest. Please, if someone reads this, hear out my ideas for school. Why even ask in the first place if you aren't going to listen? I sincerely hope you understand what I'm saying and where I'm coming from because I'm almost ready to completely give up on getting an education. Do something, make changes, do better. So let's start our program today with some framing thoughts from Titi Lola Harley, program officer from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Titi, you have the floor. Thanks, Jimmy. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Titi Harley, and I'm a program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In the spring of 2020, nearly all of the more than 55 million K-12 students in the U.S. had to stop doing school in the way that they had been taught and engage in remote learning. Today, almost 18 months later, we continue to grapple with what the educational system should look like and feel like amidst the ever-evolving backdrop of a global pandemic. Like every one of us, it's important to remember that students have lived through an especially unique and challenging school year. For some, this month will mark the first time they will be back in school, in a school building in person with their friends and teachers in over a year. Others will continue on with, with remote learning as their ongoing new normal. 
While there have been numerous efforts to hear the important perspectives of adults in K-12 education, from educators to administrators to families, there's very little firsthand data from students themselves. This is why Youth Truth and the Youth Truth Surveys are so important and why we at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been so fortunate to partner with them to gather insights directly from our young people during this precarious time. Throughout the pandemic, Youth Truth has provided three touch points to provide a breadth of data that gives us a glimpse into how students have really experienced school over the past year, where we have collectively improved over the course of the last 18 months and where we have fallen short and for which group of groups of students, and what students need and want out of their schools and educators in the months ahead. We are so excited about the launch of this final report of the three-part Students' Way In series, through which more than 200,000 students have shared their experiences and feedback about learning and well-being in spring 2021. At the Gates Foundation, we are committed to keeping students at the center of our decision-making and, more often than not, that means coming face to face with the real impacts of even the most well-intentioned efforts. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear about some bright spots that our students have seen and experienced, but we will also hear some sobering truths about how quickly it seems we are returning to the status quo that candidly was not all that great to begin with. Although this is a tough pill to swallow, I'm hopeful because of the strong voices of our students who offer actionable feedback about how and where to target support and who seek to partner with adults in creating solutions. We are working hard to take our lead from them to create an educational system where all students' social and emotional well being is taken into account, where educators foster learning environments that are culturally responsive and affirm students' full identities, and where each and every one of our students is able to thrive academically especially those who have and continue to face inequities in a system designed without them in mind. But to do any of this, we must first listen. That is our job today and always. And so it's with great pleasure that I turn things back over to the Youth, to the youth Truth team to share the latest findings from Students' Way In Part 3. Thank you so much, Titi. So before we actually do that, I want to turn uh, to our speakers and our panelists to introduce themselves and their districts. We have also asked them to add just a little reflection before we turn to our findings and look ahead to the upcoming school year by sharing just three words to describe their experience with the 2021 school year. So Dr. Eric Prater from San Luis Coastal, we will start with you. Thank you, Jimmy, and, and thank you for having me here today. My name is Eric Prater, and I've been a superintendent in the San Luis Coastal Unified School District for 12 years. We are located on the central coast of California, approximately 90 minutes north of Santa Barbara. We represent the cities and towns of Morro Bay, Los Osos, San Luis Obispo, and Avila Beach, with approximately 8,000 students and 16 schools K-12, pre-K-12. Our population demographics are 75% white and about 20% Latino. Those are our primary populations with an economically disadvantaged population of approximately 35%. Cal Poly State University or Cal Poly is in our backyard with about 25,000 students and faculty who contribute to the vibrant and youthful climate of our community. We like to um, Think of ourselves as high performing, progressive, and equity minded, interested in meeting the needs of all students. Many of our schools are distinguished and blue ribbon honorees. While we have a really good district, um, we certainly have a long way to go before we're considered great. We are fortunate to have maintained a stable school board uh, and district leadership team over the past decade. The three words that I would use to describe the, the past year would be astounding with feeding over a million uh, meals and mobilizing online instruction for thousands of students. Uh, opportunity would be my second word, moving to innovative practices and shifting the way we educate and collaborate with each other traditionally. And uh, the third word would be treacherous. Anyone in a leadership role or on a school board uh, is at risk of losing or gaining everything. And I think there's a lot at stake there. Thank you for having me. 
And next we'll go to Dr. Reggiani. Good morning. My name is Shelley Reggiani. I'm the Executive Director of Equity, Community Engagement, and Communications for the North Clackamas School District. North Clackamas is an area just south of Portland in Oregon in the northwest corner of our state. North Clackamas is a district of 33 schools and about 17,300 students. We are a growing community and a diverse community, linguistically, racially, culturally, et cetera. With any given week, we have about 65 different spoken languages as partners to English in our community. We are approximately 35 to 40% free and reduced lunch. And we have growing, as I mentioned, diversity in multiple ways inside of our community. As I think about North Clackamas, I think about um, equity, engagement, care, integrity, and excellence. And those are our core pillars of what drives us inside um, North Clackamas. I appreciated hearing uh, Dr. Prater before just talking about what drives his community. Similarly, in schools, we faced many of the same challenges. And the three words that I would um, Describe this past year, I would say commitment as number one, commitment to our students and to our communities, that we would listen, that we would return to what they had said, that we would revisit areas where we weren't showing up with our best strengths and try and try again and continue that commitment for partnership. And I would say the second word is directly related to that, and that is relationship. We noticed that when we centered on relationship with our students and with our community, that's where we found collective strength amidst the pain, amidst the hurt, amidst all of the changing challenges that seem to be constant this last year. Relationships is where we found the most hope and the most generative um, experiences with one another. And that leads me to the third word um, in my reflection from this past year, which would be silver linings. A little bit of a dash in the middle of there, but uh, silver linings most certainly. We learned that for so many of our students, um, return to normal meant return to something that, that may not have been meeting their needs. And for some of our students who were thriving in distance learning, they were thriving for specific reasons. We also found that some of the innovation that we had uh, discovered amongst ourselves and our resiliency with our students and families and educators, those were things that we want to move forward. So as we return to better circumstances in education, taking the silver linings with us in our experiences as we continue to focus on our commitment and our relationships. All right, and finally, let's go to Ms. Stephanie Sibley. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you, Jimmy. So I'm Stephanie Sibley, and I have the honor of being um, a house principal, similar to an assistant principal at Malden High School. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Malden is an urban city located about 10 miles north of Boston, Massachusetts. And our um, high school has roughly 1,800 students. And we have been referred to um, as a district as one of the most diverse districts, um, definitely in Massachusetts and maybe even in the country. We have um, roughly about 25% of students from sort of the four um, major uh, racial groups. And, um, and, but we're represented by students from over a hundred different countries. So, um, so when I reflected on um, this past, year and a half really, if you go back to March, 2020. Um, the three words that um, kind of came to my mind, the first was adaptability. And I think about March 12th, which is the day that we received word that we were going to be um, shutting down. And, um, and quickly we as a school, as teachers, um, administrators, students, we all adapted. Um, getting devices out to students, getting hotspots out to students, putting in um, a system to deliver breakfast, you know, having breakfast and lunch available for students. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were not a universal um, lunch uh, district, but we are now. And so um, we have adapted to all of the changes and um, challenges that have been presented to us. So adaptability is definitely a word that comes to mind. Um, my second word, similar to others that have spoken, is innovation. Um, because with the, uh, each adaptation, we had to innovate. We had to do things differently than we'd ever done them before. And so um, 
big kudos to the teachers at our school um, and all of the different ways that they uh, uh, delivered instruction, um, whether it was through uh, Desmos in the math class, um, Nearpod, um, they were so, um, I guess, excited and flexible in figuring out how to deliver content to our students. And then as a house principal, you know, I had to innovate when it came to outreach to students. And so um, definitely did a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, Google Meet meetings with students. Uh, we met outside, um, whatever we needed to do to, um, to reach out and to support students, uh, we did that. We did Zoom, uh, um, open houses, excuse me, um, and parent meetings. So innovation is definitely um, an important part of the reflection. And when we think about what we wanna carry forward, um, many of these innovative practices are things we will continue to um, use in the upcoming school year. And then my third word is kind of related to the other two and it's lemonade sort of a reference to Beyonce. We were given um, some really tough situations and challenges. Um, I think about um, all of the um, students who got sick or whose families were sick. Um, and that forced us to create more supports and more resources in our school and, and to identify resources in our community to support those students and those families. Um, I think about you know, all of the things that were canceled for seniors. And we, again, we stepped up to the plate and we figured out a way to do prom. Um, we still had a yearbook. So I just felt like no matter what was thrown at us, we came together as a community to make sure that we could pull things through for our students and our families and our faculty. So lemonade is my third word. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you all so much for those reflections. I was not expecting a Beyonce reference in this webinar, but I'm so happy that it happened. So thank you, Stephanie. All right, so who are we listening to in this presentation? In our analysis, we heard from more than 200,000 students in 585 schools across 19 states. If you wanna know a little bit more about our sample, we'll be sending you the link to our full report after this, so you can look in there. And today we are going to share our four areas of insight with you. The first being social, emotional, and academic development, then students' obstacles to learning, respect and teacher support, before finally ending with students' plans for the future. And our panelists are going to be coming back in to reflect on some of these findings as we go through today. So I'll turn it over now to my colleague, Dr. Jen DeForest, to walk us through our first area of insight. Thanks, Jimmy. And thank you to everyone for all that great framing. So let's turn to our first area of insight, which points to the importance of tending to both students' social emotional well-being and to their academic development. Let's start by looking at two measures of students' perceptions their perceptions of learning and their perceptions of belonging. That feeling of belonging is of course a key indicator of a healthy school environment. In the decade before the pandemic, 57% of students reported that they learned a lot every day. At the same time, 43% agreed that they experienced belonging and that they felt like a part of their school's community. While not surprising, it was concerning that in the transition to emergency distance learning, both of these numbers dropped precipitously by 18 and 13 points respectively. Yet, as you can see, students and teachers adapted to many of the challenges of learning during the pandemic and the learn a lot response jumped to 61% in the fall of 2020. Students' sense of belonging also improved, jumping to 49% last fall surpassing the pre-COVID quote unquote normal. Alas, in our most recent survey, both learning and belonging dropped back to pre-COVID numbers, spot on. Okay, let's begin to make sense of this. To understand the challenges confronting students, we ask them, what makes it hard for you to do your best in school? In spring 2021, most students, 78%, reported at least one obstacle to doing their best in school. And the most frequently cited obstacle was feeling depressed, stressed, or anxious, or students' own mental health. As you can see indicated by the orange carrot, this was a, a significant increase over fall 2020. 
So let's look a little more closely now at mental health, but keep this list in mind as Jimmy will return to it in our next area of insight. As you can see here, there's a striking trend that has persisted through the pandemic as girls and students who identify in another way than the binary have been significantly more likely to report that their mental health was impeding their education. This is in tune with other reporting and research, including the Trevor Project's most recent survey on the mental health of LGBTQ youth, which reminds us that the pandemic has made the lives of already vulnerable young people even more stressful. Okay, here we wanna figuratively hit the pause button and share two highly actionable and concerning findings related to mental health. First, see that orange line. Even as students' mental health needs climbed through the pandemic, the percentage of students reporting that they had an adult in school to talk to about their mental health dropped. That's the blue line. There's an important opportunity here to remedy this pattern. Second, Related to student-teacher relationships, at the outbreak of the pandemic, students surprised us as the percentage who agreed that their teachers made an effort to understand their lives outside of school increased a whopping 17%. You can see the peak in the chart here. And as you can see, that number dropped across the 2021 school year. Here too, we see an opportunity. What changed? Why did we lose that high ground? And how can we recover those relationships? Let's listen to what students have to say about this in our second qualitative composite, this time animated. Here you'll hear how, for many, learning and relationships were diminished as the school experience became reduced to a never-ending series of assignments. Many students in their responses described this as a sort of groundhog's day, actually using those terms. All right. Chill on the workload. It's too much. Really, really, dog. Like, how do I learn so much in so little time? It's half the time, same amount of material. I feel like every day is the same, and I can just feel myself running out of mental and physical energy. I'm burnt out, and sometimes I feel stressed over nothing. My neurosis jumps out, and that harms my quality of life. Teachers can maybe help by putting out more fun assignments, make us more engaged by having convos with us, games, music because everyone is going through their own little thing. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Prater for his thoughts on this first area of insight and to share how he's using these insights to prepare for the coming year. Over to you, Eric. Thank you, Jen, I appreciate it. You know, that video and the data that was shared is very strikingly similar to what we're seeing in our data. And um, just as a point of, of um, reference, we, we've been um, working with what I call the Superintendent Student Senate for the last five years. And that, our Student Senate is representative of, of about 70 students across all of our middle and high schools. And uh, specifically, I've, uh, I've asked our site principals to select uh, a representative uh, body of, of students that really are a true um, cross section of their student population. And, um, and so we have approximately 70 students that meet with me directly, as well as my cabinet team and uh, the site leader representatives. Uh, we meet typically seven times a year and we utilize the Youth Truth uh, survey tool to inform us my interest and our interest as a district is to create a sense of, of agency, a sense of true accountability to student voice. And so since we began this uh, five years ago, I've really felt uh, each year has gotten better and better. Now, when the COVID uh, situation uh, sprung up upon us uh, 18 months ago, we had to pivot. And in that pivoting, we, we still gave the survey tool. We give it to our third graders all the way through 12th graders, as well as our staff and parent community. And uh, we have approximately 90% or even higher of our students participating in the survey. The, um, the results from last year were telling. 
they were pretty much what you saw in the video that students were were saying across the, those middle and high school years that they felt anxious overwhelmed and um and really in our case the the work that teachers were assigning uh seemed irrelevant it didn't have a sense of relevancy to their lives it was busy work so what the students are saying the student senators do in in our case is they um they form smart goals and those smart goals annually they they wrap those smart goals around what the peers said were most important as well as their anecdotal experiences in school and so what we do is we in the spring develop those smart goals and then we ask the students at each of our schools to then meet with the faculty so and share those goals and that feedback in a collaborative forum that forum between staff and students engenders a uh, an honesty a, 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 way, a way in which students can courageously share what it is they want to see now, in those SMART goals, which led into this year's planning, has to do with students saying they are desperate for meaningful, relevant work. And what's interesting is they are saying to us that they want high expectations placed on them. So they aren't looking for an easy way out. Quite the contrary. They want something meaningful and relevant with high levels of rigor along with and this is the key part along with a meaningful uh, authentic relationship with their teachers they feel that that sense of uh, relationship with the teachers makes the 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 cogs in the wheel move and um and so their goals and the feedback to their teachers from the mouths of our kids are engage us make it relevant and know our names know who we are take the time to care about who we are. So what we were able to do, and we've done this the last few years, is we have our student senators present at our board meetings in the spring. And then what our board school board does is we wrap that voice and those uh, that feedback, that data into our board annual priorities so that you see as an organization a vertical um, acknowledgement from the top down and from the bottom up so the students and the staff see as well as the parents see their voices matter that the students voice matters and so this year we're going to meet seven times i actually met last week with our site lead teams and we have uh, designed in a full calendar this year that includes not just the youth truth survey and use, utilizing those baseline data However, we, we will add to that anecdotal observations on a monthly basis of what we're actually seeing happening in our schools. Since we're opening up next week, our, I know our students are excited to come back. And so we're gonna begin to look at multiple forms of data, multiple measures, so that when the student centers meet each month, they're bringing back evidence and data that support um, our efforts to actually walk our talk. And so I feel very much that this is of the right track when when students um, are allowed to share their honest thoughts and opinions, it really does make a difference. And um, and so we have created uh, these forums, these opportunities for them to speak. And I'm personally very excited about that. And this year, one of the things we're doing a little bit differently that I'm excited about is we're uh, actually going to have our student senators work with uh, community leaders. And we're going to create in February, we're going to create a uh, student engagement conference for all seventh through ninth graders in our district. And uh, we have an event center at the Madonna Expo. And, um, and we intend to bring in keynote speakers, create individual workshops with local and regional uh, um, leaders in the areas of equity, um, social emotional leadership, and, um, and responsiveness. And so we, we are looking forward to a full day workshop in February where the students are, are leader, the student leaders are running it. And so um, that's what we're doing in San Luis Coastal. And I just uh, can't say enough about Youth Truth and the way in which it has allowed us to have credible data that 
can be transitioned into a very powerful lever for change and student agency in our district. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. And so our second area of insight today, explicate students' obstacles to learning. So remember that Jen told us a little earlier that 78% of students reported having at least one obstacle to their learning in spring 2021. And here again is that obstacles to learning list. So I'll read through a few of them for you. Uh, feeling depressed, stressed, or anxious, distractions at home and family responsibilities, not having an adult who can help me with my schoolwork, limited or no access to a computer or device, and feelings of safety at school as well as at home. But let's turn this list a little bit and think about students' obstacle loads. So while it was heartening to see that the average obstacle load decreased from 2.14 in the fall to 1.93 this spring, there are again concerning differences among students. Similar to our fall findings, we see that white and Asian students experience significantly fewer obstacles to learning than their non-white and non-Asian peers. However, we want to point out that Asian students were the only group whose obstacle load increased between fall and spring. All other groups saw a decrease in their obstacle load. That said, our qualitative analyses reminds us that even one obstacle can be a formidable barrier to students learning. So we hope that you'll explore more of these findings in our report, and we just wanna share two of them here with you. So first, as you can see, 21% of Hispanic or Latinx students reported not having a teacher available to help them with their schoolwork, compared to just 14% of non-Hispanic Latinx students. Now second, we'd like to share another composite of qualitative comments, this time from Black or African American students. So in this instance, we investigated how Black students who reported at least one obstacle to learning described and made meaning of what got in the way of their learning. This composite is a poignant expression of the student experience as the pandemic intersected with the Black Lives Matter movement, and it highlights students' recommendations for improving their schools. So let's listen in. Support me by being diverse. There aren't many Hispanic or Black teachers. Stop making us copy notes and help us think. Tie learning to real and current issues. I understand this is the last thing on teachers' mind because of COVID, but I at least expect social studies to bring up current topics. We also want to talk about racism and how it's affecting us as students. I wanna learn about things that affect me and my family and friends, mainly black culture and history. Assignments don't appeal to my race and don't inspire me. Do better, do better. All right, <clears throat> in our third area of insight, we are going to to illuminate the intersection of equity and relationships in school. In particular, let's take a look at students' perceptions of respect from their teachers and students' experiences of academic support. In the decade prior to the pandemic, 57% of secondary students indicated that adults at the school treat students with respect. And during the turbulence of fall 2020, this number jumped to 73%. And here, in this instance, that gain held into the spring when 70% of students continued to agree that adults in their school treat students with respect. However, we noticed something interesting when we looked at the details. In short, in every grouping, a larger percentage of students in the majority group tended to perceive respect. So for example, a larger number of students who identify as straight reported that adults respect people from different sexual orientations. So too did a larger percentage of white students report that adults respect people from different races or ethnicities. 
This is a very powerful reminder of how disaggregating data can help us to temper our own assumptions and check any tendency that we might have to privilege the majority perception. Like students' perceptions of respect, students' perceptions of teacher support were also promising. During the pandemic, students reported an improved sense that most of their teachers were willing to give them extra help when they needed it. A larger percentage also agreed that most or all of their teachers would not let people give up when the work gets hard. And both of these gains proved durable into the spring. So a little silver lining or lemonade there. Let's hand that over to Dr. Reggiani to offer her thoughts about these trends and the start of school up in North Blackness. Over to you, Shelley. Thank you, Dr. DeForest. Wow, um, listening to our students and what they have to say about, about both obstacles to learning and our third area of really focusing on equity. As I mentioned earlier in North Clackamas, we have five areas of focus as part of our strategic direction. And that begins with equity, engagement, care, integrity, and excellence. And we try to center those, those pillars, if you will, in the work that we're doing with students. I, I wanna first start out by addressing the obstacles to learning piece. Um, Wow, it really hit us in the heart when we listened to what our students had to say in the spring of 2020. We were one of those fortunate districts that did a spring survey right prior to school emergency closures and then right at the, the heart uh, of emergency school closures. So we could see the difference. And similar to what Dr. DeForest presented in the data, we saw um, some decreases and increases in student experience. And the obstacles to learning was, was absolutely fascinating to see. And it was most critical for us to pay attention to. Our students were telling us that social distancing was leading to social isolation, um, that they needed access to school counselors, they needed access to support mental health. Those obstacles were things so personal and so dear to our students. And as we, we think about the, the mental health and well being of our students, um, their need to access some basic things as uh, connection to adults talking with other human beings, talking with students their age, having access to food, et cetera. We needed to stop and say, how can we do business of school in a way that is holistic, that is student-centered and meets their needs in the midst of the pandemic? So similar to what Dr. Prater was saying about the, the need to innovate and, and shift and to provide meals in different ways, we had to reshape our thinking in the service model of the social determinants of health and education and the convergence of those um, in addressing the obstacles to learning. Immediately, we went into the mode of uh, listening to the students and directly creating deeper foundations for those relationships with teachers and with adults, and direct connections with school counselors, and also increasing student and family access to mental health services. This one was key. Uh, we think about some of those silver linings, as I mentioned before. This is one of the pieces that we're taking with us uh, from this, this pandemic experience. Prior to the pandemic, we uh, had some professional mental health providers partnering in our school districts where we had some access across our schools. And those were in-person appointments, mostly for students and occasionally with families. And with the shift uh, to telehealth, what an opportunity that became for our students and families. We worked with our partners, our social services director immediately um, made deeper relationships with our county mental health providers and our other local partner mental health providers so that we could expand telehealth to each student within our school district. Again, looking at the scope of the number of students who were telling us they, they needed support and they needed access regardless of one's ability to access insurance. I need support. And through telehealth, students were also not missing school um, and they're online. And when we went back to hybrid, they weren't missing school in order to access those services. We're carrying that with us. This was family therapy. This was individual student therapy that helped students adjust, make meaning of their world that they were experiencing at that time. And is something that has given us a source of strength. And I'd say the other component there with obstacles to learning definitely ties in with that relationship with adults. Students were telling us, particularly at one of our high schools, at Milwaukee High School, we found that students, their percentage of their relationship with teachers was significantly higher than across the rest of our district. And we needed to ask why. So we dug a little bit deeper with their principal, Carmen Gelman, and learned about how they were, how they were 
really addressing that need. Uh, and we found that there were some things that we could replicate. And that's one of the things that we took forward into this last school year, having specific times for teachers to connect with students, consistency was one of the things that our students told us that they needed. They needed access to adults and not tomorrow or next week. They needed it that day and new and inventive ways for them to connect. The other thing that I would like to talk about is that that lens of equity and Dr. DeForest was talking about this and the way that we disaggregate data. This is powerful. And if there's a takeaway that I can encourage each person on our webinar today to think about is the way that you disaggregate your data. Youth Truth does an amazing job of giving us this picture, this wealth of our students. And we've asked Youth Truth to help us dig deeper in understanding who our students are. That's critical for us in North Clackamas. That has been one of our foundational principles to continue to analyze data and disaggregate it though by student group, because we have found that there are times um, when we look at the all, we can get a generalized picture and that is definitely helpful. But if we fail to peel back the layers and say who is benefiting, who may not be in this situation, um, then we're missing something that all can mask hidden pockets of students who are experiencing school differently than their peers based off of a component of their identity. And that's critical for us. We um, need to make sure that our students are accessing school and have places to thrive. And that's part of our equity focus um, where we allocate resources as well, where we allocate additional support so that our students can th thrive. And that equity focus for us um, means examining all of our practices, each of those practices, and identifying and removing barriers in order for students to reach their full potential. And that's inclusive of race, home language, immigration status, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, family makeup, et cetera, all of those components of, of what makes a student so that school can be accessible. And as we move forward and what we're thinking about uh, moving forward into this next year, how are we taking and centering student voice? Stakeholder engagement is one of the core principles of my personal work here in the, in the district. And this next year, we're going to be engaging in our strategic plan, our strategic plan that will help design the way we move forward, our path forward, in our school district for the next four years, parents, staff, community members, and our students. We're going to be using the youth truth data from this past couple of years to really center the student experience about school, about relationships, about their future, and then diving deeper and doing additional focus groups with students. Our student leaders, our student leaders show up both inside leadership class and outside of leadership class, inside student government, and also inside of culturally specific groups of students, whether it's their affinities or their alliance groups that we have, our students who are involved in the arts, as well as our students who are involved in sports. How can we bring students together based off of what we've learned inside of Youth Truth, gather in-person focus groups to help drive that student voice to drive our community strategic plan for our school district for the next four years. And that's part of our commitment, our commitment to continue to listen. Um, our students are have such a wealth of information. And the last thing that I would add, uh, this section particularly reminded me about student agency. When uh, that, that beautiful piece in that last cartoon illustration showed the student saying, what matters to me in my learning? When we're listening deeply to our students and hearing those nuggets of absolute wealth, it makes me think about Gloria Ladson Billings and culturally responsive teaching pedagogy and the three pillars of academic achievement where there are high standards for absolutely every student and cultural competence and socio-political context, that's where the student agency comes in, where students need to see themselves as capable and that they know that their teacher also sees them as capable, that they can, and that the work is relevant and that it matters to them. So as we ask students to think critically about their social issues, both historical and contemporary, those things have to go together. We engage them through that lens in a way that matters to them. And we're going to find that not only does the engagement increase, how we know our students more deeply will also increase, which will strengthen and deepen our relationships with our students. Those are some of the exciting takeaways that I think about from the data um, in these sections of Youth Truth. Thank you so, so much, Shelly. Always wonderful to hear from you. So our final area of insight today 
is students' plans for the future. So let's again hit that figurative pause button to look at some really concerning and actionable findings. So this spring, more than one in four seniors, 28%, reported that their plans for after high school changed since, since the start of the pandemic, a significant increase from the 25% in the fall and the 18% during emergency distance learning last spring. And as you can see here, perhaps unsurprisingly, there are specific groups of students who are more likely to indicate that their post high school plans have changed. Relative to their peers, a higher proportion of seniors eligible for free and reduced price lunch, those who are Hispanic or Latinx, and those who are taking special classes to learn English report changing their plans. So what did the class of 2021 say they, that they plan to do next? Well, there's been widespread concern as college enrollments have dropped over the course of the pandemic, an indicator that for many college going plans have been derailed. And this trend was also evident in our data. So the percentage of seniors planning to attend a four-year and two-year colleges declined in 2020 and remained lower than pre-pandemic levels in spring 2021. In particular, the percentage of seniors this spring who reported that they plan to attend a four-year college dropped to below half, to 48%. This is an important signal for higher education enrollment predictions. Now, improving access to higher education demands our attention and students expressed a strong desire in their qualitative comments for more counselors and more personalized support navigating the application process. Many students plead for access to more substantive career and technical education courses to help them successfully chart a pathway to self-sufficiency and into a job. Compared to pre-pandemic responses in spring 2021, more students report that they plan to work full-time and a full 10% remains unsure of what their next step will be. So now I'd like to turn it over to our final panelist, House Principal Stephanie Sibley, for her thoughts on these findings, how she is using these insights to prepare for the coming school year, and, and just any other reflections that she may have. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Jimmy. So at this point, we as a school, we don't have, um, data about the seniors from the class of uh, 2021. But I know just based on the other uh, piece of the finding around where students um, are asking for, pleading for more support around the college application process and definitely interested in taking more courses or having more opportunities, internships for career exploration. Um, our data at our school definitely reflected that. Unlike the other two panelists who've spoken, um, our school district, this was the first year, um, October of 2020, for our school to participate in the, Youth Truth, in the Youth Truth Survey. And so we have one data point, which is what we used to really um, get our own students involved in looking at the survey data. So last fall, when we got our survey data, we, um, led by myself, we cr created a group of students recruited a group of students to actually dig into the youth truth data. And one of the areas that they were really um, excited about and also disappointed about was the college and career readiness. Um, they were surprised that so many students across um, grade levels, across uh, racial and, and language groups were saying that they didn't receive enough help understanding the college application process. And they also, um, hadn't gotten enough support figuring out what careers um, they were interested in. And when the students shared this data with our school counselors, it stung because I think our school counselors work really hard to make sure that they are, you know, providing students support. They have classroom, they had Google Classroom set up to help students with the college application process. When we were in person, they actually had a classroom set up and offered support in that way. They use Naviance. There's all these different tools and resources that they feel they've provided. Um, and yet the perceptions of students is that it's not enough. It's not sufficient. Um, too many students are um, going through that process feeling like they don't have enough support. 
So um, rather than kind of stay in that place where, well, we're doing it, the students aren't coming, um, they decided to sort of say, okay, what can we do differently? And so the school counselors um, used the youth truth data in their planning this past June to really think about the upcoming school year, being back in person and wanting to make sure that um, like we're all trying to do, how do we emphasize relationship building as students come back into, um, into the school building for in-person learning? So they're going to continue to um, sort of use all of the tools they were using before, but in probably the most significant change um, is around communication. So obviously email is important, the website is important, but they realized they weren't really utilizing Twitter in the way that they could use or Instagram, some of these other social media platforms. They also wanna enlist student ambassadors to help get the message out about, you know, um, career opportunity um, workshops and things that they offer. And so they're going to be enlisting students to help get the word out. The other thing is we have a new schedule this coming school year and it's a block schedule. And um, each day there'll be an opportunity for students to receive support. Um, so it's called a support block where students can go see their academic teachers or they can go see another faculty member. And so the guidance team will be offering workshops small group meetings, discussions on the application process, as well as all the other guidance related um, um, topics. And they'll be using that um, to do even more outreach to students. Um, they really strongly feel that um, similar to what happens in the ninth grade where the ninth grade guidance counselor makes sure that she, he or she meets every single freshman, they really wanna use that frame for reaching out to sophomores and juniors because they feel like those are the two uh, grade levels that um, the data shows feel like they know the least about some of these processes and opportunities. Um, one thing that um, as I looked back over the work that this youth, um, our Youth Truth Student Voice Group did, um, one of the quotes that I took away from their conversation with them um, they said that they heard from a lot of students because not only did they have the survey data, but they also conducted focus groups with other students. And they said that they're hearing that conversations around colleges and careers haven't been normalized. Um, and that many people either see, don't see themselves succeeding in college or that they're able to even get the support that they need to even go to college. So I do think that some of the sort of um, ways that our guidance team is looking to sort of improve outreach, improve access, I think will um, signal to students that they do have the support. Um, and so um, they're, they're pretty excited about that. Um, so we know that personalization will be very important in the upcoming school year. And um, we're looking forward to um, welcoming back our students, but also looking forward to helping to, to giving them to help us lead uh, this, this outreach and communication um, to their peers. Thank you, Jimmy. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. <clears throat> so we've got some time <clears throat> for a few questions. We have a couple prepared questions. Uh, if you'd like to put yours in the Q&A box, um, we will collect them there as well. The first question that I have is for TT. TT, in light of all this information and what you've learned over the past year, can you give a piece of advice or two to the funders on the webinar? How would you suggest that they use these findings to support students and teachers? Sure, thank you, Jen. Um, I think that there are a couple of things that come to mind. The first is um, to take the opportunity to use the data in this report. Um, and the, the prior two reports as a springboard for more in-depth engagement with students. Um, I felt, and I imagine others on the call did too, the, the first quote that we heard from student, the student um, in this webinar around just wanting to be heard and to have you know, people listen. And I think that I know in my organization, we talk a lot about centering student voice and we are becoming a lot more adept at a partnering with organizations who allow us to truly hear from students. Um, we, in fact, uh, last week I had the great opportunity to hear from uh, several cohorts of high school students who a partner helped us to convene over five weeks to talk about what it would mean for their um, school and their uh, 
ELA and math courses to be more culturally responsive. And these students just came up with concrete, actionable feedback that um, really helps us to know where we've gotten it right in our plan strategy and where we still have not. And um, that was really valuable. But I think the other important piece to think about is that it's very easy for it to become performative. And the other thing that that student said in that quote was, why are you even listening or, or asking us for feedback if you're not going to do something? And I think that putting, um, taking the opportunity to listen to students without being um, planning to, to actually do something with what we hear um, and trying to use it to instead verify what we think can be really dangerous and really damaging. And so working hard to ensure that when you seek out insight from students that you're taking the opportunity also to be flexible in what is planned um, so that you can be reactive to what you're hearing. The second thing I would say is these findings have really highlighted how necessary it is for students to feel that their education affirms who they are fully and, and that it's relevant to them and their communities and what they hope to achieve. And so we are um, being very thoughtful about what it means to um, really uh, make investments and, and think about how to support schools in um, improving their social and emotional um, supports embedded within their education and, and becoming more culturally responsive. We recently released um, um, information on our phase two phase of our Algebra One Grand Challenge where all of our grantees in that um, are, are innovative, new, um, many new grantees who are thinking about how to make Algebra One more accessible, more relevant and collaborative for students. And so doing a lot more to think beyond the um, academics, but to the things that create the learning conditions that allow students, all students to thrive. Um, we, we have a special focus on black students, Latino students, English language learners, and those impacted by poverty. And um, we are realizing how important data like the Youth Truth Surveys and, and um, other related data is to understanding how, the, how these students experience the education and what we need to do to ensure that the environments that they're in allow them to thrive. So those would be the two things that um, I would leave with my colleagues in the fund, fundraising space or the funding space. Yeah, thank you so much, TT. If you could all our panelists turn, on, turn your cameras on at this point. So we are um, about one minute to time. So I have a summative question for you that actually dovetails really beautifully with what we had planned that comes from George. So George asked the question, um, how can we support student members of school boards, trustees, those that you involve in these conversations to be more effective and less tokenized? So if you'd like to turn off your cameras, Jimmy will get us all on screen and let's do a lightning round to answer that question. So uh, let's have Eric first and then Philly and then Stephanie. Um, how do you bring kids in and give them more agency in the moment as you start this new school year and you know, work to not tokenize them? Eric, thoughts? Wow, that's an excellent question and it's a slippery slope. I, I think you have to really think carefully about the, the students that you select to participate in this effort, as well, um, as, well as you really need to meet, do, do your legwork um, with the teachers, with the principals, the site leaders, um, to make sure that there's, uh, there's credibility at the local level, at the site level, that there's credibility there before you start elevating it to the board level. And I've seen uh, evidence of that where you have certain students speaking at, at board meetings or in the superintendent circle, and they may not be representative of the collective. And I've seen evidence of that. So the tokenism comes when that happens. So you've got to really bring it up from the, from the classroom site uh, level with credibility um, intentionally. That would be my advice. Thank you so much, Eric. All right, Shelly, thoughts? Wow, I'm building off of what both TT and Eric have, have said. Um, as mentioned, the student focus groups is, is a component of the core work that we're doing, but there's something that's really important that we also learned from the youth truth data. Students want to see our actions. Students want to know that they were heard and something happened as a result. When they tell us to do better, that's not a suggestion. They're looking for action from their adults, their trusting adults. So I think about what are the multiple ways that our students can be heard, feel heard, 
and be seen. And that's incumbent upon the adults to change the way that we respond to students. Number one, uh, with gratitude that we heard you. And these are going to be the things that happen as a result and that it's not a one-off. It's bi-directional communication that's ongoing and we're checking to see if we got it right. So we're checking not, again, just with the all, but really going deeply into the different student um, identity groups and, and making sure that there's an established communication there. Adrienne Murray Brown in her emergent strategy book called that talks about moving at the speed of trust. Trust. When we move at the speed of trust, that's when we're affirming our students and their lived experiences as real. And when we transparently communicate, this is what we're going to do as a result of what you shared. That's one of the fastest and deepest ways that we can continue to build trust with our students. And that builds trust with our staff and our community as well, because we've elevated our students and said, you've mattered so much that this education that we're designing for you, we're designing with you, not without you, you at the center. And I think that's one of the deepest ways that we can build trust with our students. Beautiful. Thank you, Shelley. Stephanie. Thank you, Jen. So I want to just echo um, what Shelly just said about students want to not only be heard, but they want to see results. They want to see um, sort of the manifestation of um, their voice, um, whether it's at the school level or the district level. So one of the things that um, we did this year, even in working with our student voice group, is we when we recruited, we wanted to make sure that we had students from all the different sort of groups, not just racial and ethnic groups, but all the different kinds of students that we have in our school, different perspectives, different um, ideologies. And we identified, um, we call it a near peer in our school. She's a faculty member, but she's closer to their age than, than certainly I am. And she worked very closely with them. I coached her because she had never done anything like this before. And then she worked with the students. And we did practice uh, PowerPoint, you know, talks and so that they would get comfortable talking in front of adults about the data that they were examining. And from that group, then that's the group that the, the principal would then sort of look to to elevate to other kinds of leadership roles in the school. So I think this idea of collaborating with students, making sure they see um, the impact of their voice. Um, in the school community and making sure they understand that whatever structures you put in place, that they're there to stay. Just, I am so grateful to the three of you. You are so inspiring. Um, we want to thank everybody so much for joining this webinar. I know there were more questions um, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. I want to thank our panelists again, TT, Eric, Shelley, Stephanie, as well as my wonderful colleague, Jimmy Simpson and all of my awesome team members on the Youth Truth team who worked on this project. We will follow up with all of you. We'll send a copy of the slide deck as well as a link for the website. Um, you'll be able to find more data. There are a lot of more animated videos and qualitative composites that we hope you will explore. Um, and please spread the word on these mater materials. Whether you are a funder or a school person, we also encourage you to reach out to us if you wanna learn more about working with us to measure the student experience as we all work, work this year to make our schools even better. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, have a wonderful start of school. Bye-bye.